Andrew, thank you for your patience. I do appreciate that. To the other gentleman, I don't remember who it was right now, but you could call back and you'd be in the green room. I do have a couple people in front of you, but now let me get to the guy that I got in front of me. How you doing, Andrew? What's going on? Hey, I'm doing good, uh, vocab. Are you able to hear me clearly? I can hear you, man. You're a little close to the camera, but if that's how close you got to be for volume, then I understand. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I apologize about that. I just wanted to bring a little bit of smoke, I guess we could say. I just wanted to ask you three questions. I will keep it, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I'll keep it minimal because I do want to be respectable to the people behind me in chat. Uh, but let's start off with, um, from your understanding, like what happens to um, a person when they die, right? Like most Christians I've spoke to, they'll tell me that, you know, if you're righteous, you go, at, you know, to see Jesus in heaven. Or, um, you know, if you're wicked, you die and go straight to hell. Do you subscribe to that or like what's your perspective on that? Uh, to be absent from the body, to be present from the Lord for the christian so uh and you know people say heaven and i always kind of want to if they say heaven i want to know what they mean by that but uh the biblical indication i see is you're immediately in the presence uh of the lord now that's not your final state because you have not been resurrected bodily yet so it's a temporary situation i think you know it's interesting though how does time work in that situation i don't know exactly but I do believe that's the case, and I do, I think, it's not just the passage, you know, to be absent from the body is present with the Lord, but I think that's a one I would take. Serapis, I do got you in the green room, but you're in the green room, a couple people ahead of you, but I do got you in the green room, so hold your spot, my friend. Uh, and then well, okay. as far so, as the, so the wicked, say, yeah, 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 go, yeah ahead. go ahead. As, yeah, far, as, as, as far as the wicked, I guess we might say Hades, which is going to be, you know, maybe one word to describe it. Which, uh, my understanding, I think, is going to be, for lack of a better way to put it, thrown into the lake of fire at the end. So it's not the final place for the wicked either, but it's not the place you want to be. I would take but, but some like of that probably for the parable. Huh? Are the wicked in, like, hell right now, like, burning? or like, like what's See, the, it's, it's the term hell. In the English, it's a, it's, there's several Greek words, and even a Hebrew, I believe, that, that get translated as hell. So it, so that's why I would probably say Hades, with the end destination after a after a judgment for the wicked after with an end destination of, as a lake of fire. So I would I would want to say Hades, then on to the way of the lake of fire after the judgment. Okay, but like like right now, if they're unrighteous, they're in a condition of suffering right now. Right? I think you could describe it that way, and I would I would draw okay. information from the the parable with the rich man. Okay. Well, could I ask you, what about, um, what is that, First Samuel chapter 28, verse 19? Um, they summoned the spirit of Samuel, and he told King Saul, because at this point, King Saul was unrighteous, right? So Samuel told King Saul that when he's going to die, there's going to be a war tomorrow, him and his sons are going to die. And he told them that they're all going to rest again, right? They're going to all be together. And another good one that I'd have yeah, to ask Yeah, I, I take that as say, him just saying, you're going to join me in death. That's the way. Okay. That's the way. That's the way I understand that. Okay. What about um, Job chapter three? If you start at verse eight on down, it speaks about um, there the wicked they cease from troubling, and there the weary are at rest. Right. So Job, if you read the chapter, he was speaking of, you know, he wishes he would have passed away. So he goes into describe uh, what would have happened if he was to die from the womb. Right. So he goes into describe the spiritual realm, and he says there the wicked they cease from troubling. Right. So wait, I'm wait, just wait, trying. Wait, Job, where did you say though? Uh, Job chapter 3. I believe you can start at verse 8 and read on down, but it's in Job chapter 3. Let's start it over loud. Uh, because it did not... No, this is about the Leviathan. Let me see. Oh, okay, 13. Uh, for then I would have laid down and been quiet. I would have slept. Then I would have been at rest with kings and councils of the earth. So uh, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I'm talking about if he would have died. If he would have died in birth, yeah. So, so he's saying that they're the wicked, they cease from troubling. And, and if you read the whole chapter, which we don't have it for the sake of time, but if you read the chapter, he's describing the spiritual realm. Of well, where hold on. People uh, go. Wicked. Yeah. What, what, how do, what do you think it means, though, the wicked cease from troubling? Well, from my understanding, I'd say both um, the righteous and the unrighteous, they're all at rest right now, and they're all at peace. Because if you read, um, say, for an example, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, uh, go to verse um, 20 and verse 21. 
it refers to this all go one to one place, right? So everybody goes to the one place. Which yes, she all. Well, I'd say it's a spiritual realm. They all go back to the uh, the Most High. Like, I'll give an example. If you go to Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7, right? When a man dies, his spirit goes back up to the Most High. From yeah, so it, it, it's the wicked. Another way to translate Job 317 is the wicked cease from turmoil. That's the NIV. Uh, the ESV is the wicked cease from troubling. Uh, I don't. I, I'm. I'm not sure. I'm interpreting that as they don't. They don't. They don't have trouble. They don't have turmoil. It seems like uh, one indication could be you know the wicked ain't causing no more problems. The weary are at rest. But uh, do you think the Old Testament teaches that the wicked, the wicked receive rest when they die? Well, I'd say that um, I don't subscribe to the concept that when you die go to hell again i understand that when you pass away from the body whether you're a righteous person or unrighteous do you think you the wicked have rest state. though well going by the uh, the scripture there it looks like they're at they're at rest like i'll give an example in the state what of scripture is that if you go to john chapter 11 verse 11 read on down well okay, um, I'll, I'll go there but hold on what i'm saying is yeah. this passage says the wicked cease from troubling the weary are at rest I feel like you're transposing, making the wicked also be at rest. But that's not that's not the way the line proceeds. I feel like that's what you're doing there. But I don't so, feel so like that's what it's say doing. That, so, so the text doesn't say that they're the wicked, they cease from troubling. Yeah, they stop causing problems. I don't think that has to mean that they don't have any more trouble themselves. But, okay, so, so the wicked, they're not in trouble, but they're in torment in hell then or wherever... Well, I'm saying right. I'm, I'm saying the ter the term that I think is is best to use there uh, is Hades on the way to the lake of fire, but basically it's okay. a place where God is not present to bless. God is present to to pour out wrath. It's a place of judgment. It's not a place you okay. want to be. So you know, I, I, I whenever people have a viewpoint that you might be advocating, they don't like the the, the Jesus talking about the rich man and Lazarus. Or let me say that they don't like uh, what I think is a sensible interpretation of it. But to me, it really doesn't matter because he's clearly in pain. He's conscious. He's aware. He's separated from a place of favor. He's all of those things. And he's also the same person. He's saying, you know, hey, send Lazarus to give me some water. Right, and, right. and that's not and the I only place I go, but I think that's very relevant. And so, you know, it's interesting. You're going to the Old Testament, which is fine. But less had been revealed about the state of the afterlife in the Old Testament. Jesus gives the most explicit revelation about the, of the, about the afterlife. When you go to Job, this is a different type of state. And then, you know, you look at Samuel, which he's just saying you're going to be dead like me. And then if you go to other places like Ecclesiastes, he's referring to this uh, situation under the sun, sort of, especially if you live as if God doesn't exist. None of those say the other things because... You know, the Bible talks about judgment. It'd be better if Judas was never born. You don't get that if he's just can sleeping. I, I, where, where is hell at right now? Like, like is hell like underneath? I don't, it's not physical. It's not a physical realm. Where okay, is God where at? Where, well, Andrew, where is God at? Where is God? I'd say God's in, in like a, a spiritual realm. Right. So he, so it's, it's non-physical, right? Uh, yeah, I guess we could say that. Right. Same thing with hell. Okay, what do you think about, um, what is that? If you go to Jonah chapter 2, verse 2, it says, Jonah cried unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell. Right, so Jonah, he was in the, the belly of a fish, right? So yeah. what, what do you think it means when he said that he cried to the Lord out of the belly of hell? Because I've used that to say that hell can represent a condition of suffering that takes place on the, um, the earth. Well, what would you think of that scripture, Matt? Well, I understand Jonah's prayer, you know. We know where he is, right? And it's kind of a yeah, psalm. It literally the says the place is inside the fish, right? Right. So, so, so what I about... Mean, the I mean, well, hold, on. hold on. So we still kind of yeah. do this today, don't we? We'll say, I re when, for example, um, when I lost my... I'm not saying this happened to me, but someone might say, when I lost my five-year-old daughter, I was in hell. 
someone might say right. something like that even today, or I was really going through hell, or maybe more colloquial, a hell of a time. Yeah, he really had a hell of a time when his wife died from cancer. But we still use that kind of poetic language today, and this is a psalm-like prayer of Jonah, but we know where he literally was inside the fish. But him praying to God, saying he's in a place that's like death, because remember, the sea represents chaos in the Old Testament. He's, he's in a place of God's judgment. And for him, all he thinks is, I'm on my way to die. So it makes sense. And it's you know, it's more accurate translation probably there is grave, but the Hebrew word is sheol. Okay. So you don't want to muck the... Because I did have two other things I wanted to do. Okay, but you don't want to muck the English word and make it include all the concepts. That's why I don't like hell, because unfortunately the King James Version took several Greek and Hebrew words and made them all be hell. That was unfortunate, and Sheol's one of them. Sheol's one of them. So when people see hell in English, they're thinking okay. all the same thing. But he's not He's not saying like, oh, I'm in the place where sinners go to be forever. It just means Sheol. The question is, what is Sheol specifically there, you know? But go ahead. Okay, that's cool. Uh, one more on hell, because I did two other subjects I wanted to address. Um... Um, but one more on hell real quick is what about um, Amos chapter 9, verse 2? It says, though they climb up to heaven, I'll bring them down, though they dig into hell. And I'm nearly paraphrasing the, the verse. So what do you think it means when it says that people can dig into hell? I saw the Lord standing beside the altar, and he said, strike the capitals until the thresholds shake, and shatter them on the heads of all the people, and those who are left of them I will kill with the sword. Not one of them shall flee away, not one of them shall escape. If they dig into Sheol, from there shall my hand take them. If they climb up to heaven, from there I will bring them down. If they hide themselves on top of Caramel, from there I will search them out and take them. If they hide from my sight at the bottom of the sea, under the sea, there I will command the serpent, and it shall bite them. If they go into captivity before their enemies, there I will command the sword, and it shall kill them. I will fix my eyes upon them for evil and not for good. So this, this passage in Amos 9 is about the destruction of Israel. And it seems clear when you read it, he's saying wherever you right. go, you could go hypothetically. Now, people can people climb to heaven? They can't literally climb to heaven, right? Can people actually go and survive in the bottom of the sea? They can't do that. They would implode. So these are not literal places anybody's going for real. This is saying if you went as far up, as far down, wherever you go, here, there, left, right, uh, physical, not physical, the God's going to get you. The point is you can run, but you can't hide. So – this is really wait, wait a second. this is you not really that, relevant in any way to one where one. hell is or anything like that. Hmm? Wait, 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 hold on a second. And I do apologize. I don't mean to talk over you, but I think my connection might be a little behind, so I do apologize. Um, but just wanted to comment on something you said. You said people can't go down to the bottom of the ocean. But what about James Cameron when they went down to to challenge a deep? So, so did he not go down to the bottom of the ocean? Uh, yeah. People during this day would have no access to modern equipment and be able to go down to the bottom of the ocean. All right, cool, cool. Um, uh, here's another one. What about Joshua chapter 10, verse 12? I'm interested in seeing your perspective when it speaks about the sun and the moon being the ones in motion. And then also one to, to back that up is, uh, what is that, Psalms 19, verse 1. Yeah, but that's phenomenological language describing something as the way we see it. So we still, again, we still say this stuff today. I always feel like sometimes when people, um, they'll go here and they'll be like, ah, look what the Bible says. And it's like, yo, we still talk this way today. We still talk about the sun rising in the east, the sun setting in the west. We still use phenomenological language, even in our day of scientific enlightenment where we know. So when this is being spoken, this is exactly how it would appear. It's not some statement of scientific precision or accuracy. It's... It's saying this is what it looked like happened. This is what it, and uh, that's, I mean, that's simple phenomenological language. Basically, the way it, it appears or looks is the way it is. That's all it is. I don't believe that people should take this. I know people have throughout history and stuff like that. Take this for geocentrism or something like that, but I knew people do, of course. Okay. Um, so what about, um, what is that, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22, right? It's him that sits upon the circle of the earth. So you, you, you that supports the, uh, the heliocentric. Model, no, right? I don't. I think it's inconclusive there. 
I think uh, you could maybe try to say, well, it leans. You could try to maybe say it leans towards a spherical Earth, but I think it's inconclusive. I don't think it's making a comment on that. I don't think it's saying one way or the other. Oh, okay. Because uh, I would say, right, right. I'd say that, um, say for an example, if I take a dinner plate or a frisbee or a, a, a a pizza pie, right? Those are all circles, but those are all flat, right? They're not spheres. So I'd use no, yeah, that yeah. as a flatter scripture. But one more thing, because I, I do want to be respectful. Well, it, respectful it, it doesn't, but it doesn't speak to me. spherical I, or not. It, that's really not what the passage is, is okay. saying, because it just means circle, basically, or circuit or something like that. But, I mean, I guess you're advocating for geocentric flat earthism and perhaps soul sleep as well. Or annihilationism, perhaps. But go ahead. Well, I'm just asking a couple of quote. Uh, well, I didn't put my belief out there. I was just asking your perspective. Well, a no, I know I'm answering, but I'm just saying that it seems okay, clear no, there's some good. there's an angle there for you, obviously. But go well, ahead. Well, that that's correct. I would call myself a Israelite. Um, but one more thing, wait, I heard wait, you, you said, were talking Wait, did you say you call Israelite. yourself a Hebrew Israelite? I didn't even guess that. I didn't know that. Uh, but go well, ahead. Well, that, that's correct. I would call myself a Hebrew Israelite. Um, but one more thing, wait, I heard wait, you, you said, were talking Wait, did you say you call Israelite. yourself a Hebrew Israelite? I didn't even guess that. I didn't know uh, that. Correct. Oh, you are yeah, a Hebrew yeah, Israelite? Yeah, here's, here's the thing. Yo, know, li listen here. Uh, I have a YouTube page. It's called End Time Teacher, ETT. You can check me out. I've been on there for a couple of years. I mainly follow after Great Millstone. I've been following them for probably six years at this point. But I do my own uh, debate, you know, channel chat and, and whatever, man. You should stop by one day, man. We bring a bunch of uh, fellow Hebrew Israelites on there, and we always chat. So you're welcome to stop by one day if you want to have a longer conversation, man. Okay. Uh, do you What tribe on the chart would you say you believe you fall in? I'd say that I'm uh, an Issachrite. Okay. All right, man. Well, I appreciate you stopping by and, uh, you know, being a... Uh... Wait, wait, could I just ask one more, one more thing? Oh, okay, go ahead. Yeah, last one. I got to get to San Miguel, but go ahead. Yeah, 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 just, yeah, yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Just one more. I heard you say that Mystery Babylon was the entire world. I just have a question on that. If that is true, what about when it speaks about... Because, again, if you're saying the whole world's Babylon... And it's going to be burned. What about the scriptures that speak about people standing afar off for the fear of her torment, right? Like the men in the ships. So if the entire world's mystery Babylon and it's burned, where are these people who are standing afar off? Are you talking about Revelation 18? Yes, yes. Yeah, so Revelation 18, of course, you know, again, it's an apocalyptic book unveiling something using signs and symbols. So, you know, I always take that into account when I go in there. And uh, when I say Mystery Babylon being the whole world, what I mean by that is the the world system. You know, not necessarily so what's like that great city? not the globe or the sphere, but the, the system, the way the world is, the way it operates. But, but what's the great city, though? Uh, I, I, I do believe it's the, the worldly system. I think so to me, I don't take it as like the, the system is crashing and there's like actual observers. It's just a way to describe the kind of. Uh, I don't know, for lack of a better word, it's a way to describe the... But, but there's a perspective, though, but what about Revelation chapter 17, 18, that says that the woman that you seen is a great city who reigns over the kings of the earth. So, so I'm just interested in seeing, like, where is, like, the HQ of this? Because it says it's a city that reigns over the earth, right? Revelation 17 what? Uh, verse 18. The Revelation last verse. 17, 18. And you're saying that the Babylon, the Great Babylon, has to have a headquarters. Well, I, I mean, I'd say that Mystery Babylon is talking about America would be my understanding, but I'm just asking from your perspective because you you were saying that it's basically like the whole world or something like that. So I'm just like asking, where is the headquarters that this great city would be? I, you know, I, I don't know that I, I don't know I don't know what you mean headquarters. I don't think it needs headquarters, but I mean headquarters. That this great city would be. I, you know, I, I don't know that I, I don't know I don't know what you mean headquarters. I don't think it needs headquarters. But I mean, so when I look at Revelation so, seventeen, okay, well, let, let me make it. I think okay, let, let me so make it I think really you're over literalizing. But here, here's a little bit of what I see in Revelation seventeen. 
you have this initial description of the woman on the beast in 17.1. Then in verses 16 through 18, the images of the woman and the beast are sometimes used together and sometimes apart. So the woman is the city according to verse 18, but so is the beast according to verse 9. Just stop in there for a second. All that should let a person know that this is not some kind of literal description. There's clearly heavy symbolism to explain something that's real. So you have the beast and the prostitute, basically, the woman basically being one. But the beast can be seen as the people ruled by the woman as well, acting independently, which means they're not totally identical ideas or somewhat of a separation there. And so you have the verse of the beast, the people's ruled, turning on the ruler and tearing her to pieces, smashing her, devouring her, burning her. And so I would say the two points, the big points I draw out of that, evil turns upon itself, it's self-destructive, and even evil can be used to accomplish God's purposes. That's what I would draw out of that. You're looking for an actual headquarters? I don't think that's what we need here. I don't think that that doesn't make sense to me at all. The text says it's a great city, though. Yes, but, but wait this, a second, though, it's but basically the, the city of man. City. Like that's Augustine talked about. about the city of man, that's basically what it is. It's a whole system based upon worldly ideas. Okay, if you believe it's one city, what, what do you think, what idea what should I adopt that the city what? is? What do you believe I should adopt as what city is it, what do you believe? Well, I'd say that America is made up as a, it's basically one big city. That's Andrew, America's not a city. Over the city. They call See, it I, the, I thought you were going to say the USA. Let me finish it over. Let me finish but it USA quick. is not a city. And if you say it's made up of cities, well, every country in the world's made up of cities. <laughs> so America's not a city. So you're. you're right. You're, I understand that. Well, it's like a. Um, it's like a great uh, nation. I'll give you an example. If you go down to Alaska, they'll still call themselves Americans. If you go down to Florida, they'll call themselves Americans. If you go, um, you know, to New York, they'll call themselves Americans. So I'd say America is um, just one great city. That'd be but my that's, hold on, hold on, hold on. Of. If you go but to again, I if, came you, to if you go to Beijing, they'll America. call themselves Chinese. If you go to Tokyo, they call themselves Japanese. What does it have to do with anything? If you go to any place where the city is in the country, they'll refer to themselves as that nationality. If you go to Mexico City, they'll call themselves Mexicans. Well, yeah. If you go to Toronto, they'll call themselves Canadians. If right, you go to Ottawa, they'll that. call themselves Canadians. If you go to Montreal, they'll call themselves Canadians. I don't understand. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, okay, uh, let, me, let me say this then. If my understanding is flawed, I, I need from your understanding... What is that great city who has dominion over the kings of the earth? That, that's what I'm trying to understand. From your perspective. The wicked system of the world itself. So it, it a great city who has dominion over the kings of the earth. That, that's what I'm trying to understand. From your perspective. The wicked system of the world itself. So it, it's a cooperation between satanic design and the wicked, sinful hearts of humanity. It's basically built upon those foundations if you want to use that term because we essentially cooperate with satan's design because of our own rebellion we're all in a different way in rebelling it against god i don't take it i don't think there's any reason to take it as a literal city if it was it would have to be babylon because that's the city identified but i don't believe that is what it, it, babylon's a prototypical example right. of human it's empire taken. I'm not saying America's Son, good. Just I'm not, just, just, you're breaking up a little bit, so I'm losing you on this. You're pausing and coming in and out. I'm not saying it's your fault. But I'm not saying America is good when I say these things. I'm just saying America's not the one identified. America's part of it, certainly. But to make it all America, when people do that, it just seems so narcissistic typical uh, ethnos like na- like making America the center of it. I just, like there can never be a great society or there's never been such a massive society. There has and there will be, you know? We're just another footprint in the pages of history ultimately. Right, right. You, you said something about Satan real quick and then I'll jump off and let the other person on, but you said something about Satan, so, so you'd say that Satan's the one who creates evil and, and is going around the earth deceiving people, correct? creates evil i mean the first rebellion recorded i do believe you could say in the pages of the history of scripture seemed to be within within satan 
Uh, I think I think I can say that from what I can see. Um, but you know, people are born wicked under Adam, and Satan just uh, th through various means, you know, entices them to do a lot of times what they already want to do. But Satan's not the sort of he's not the blame for everything. We have our own wickedness inside of us, and uh, you know, Satan can exploit that. But well, would ultimately, you agree? God deceives people. Does God deceive people? God can use deception as a form of judgment. Okay, so you do agree God can deceive people, right? I don't believe. Well, the Bible says God cannot lie, so we gotta we gotta be careful in how we say this. God cannot lie, James says, nor he can be nor can he even be tempted in that way. So God's not lying. God's not deceiving. He's not a law, but deception, allowing, permitting, even you could say ordaining deception as a form of judgment, that's a biblical concept, no question. But God's not lying or tricking anybody himself. Okay. All right, yeah, yeah, that's cool, man. I just wanted to come on for a couple minutes uh, just to, to see your perspective on that. But once again, man, come stop by my page, uh, End Time Teacher. You'll see my face on the, uh, the icon. And yeah, we'll love to have you on sometime, man. Come stop by. All right, let me know. You seem like a guy I could go uh, talk to and stuff, uh, so I'm not opposed to that. Just maybe send me a link or something so I can see where it is, but you have a beautiful day. Yeah, yeah. Can I can I reach you at, like, a Gmail or something? Yeah, just go vocab Malone at Gmail. Okay, sounds good, man. Well, anyway, thanks for the, the chat, and, uh, and have a nice day, then. Hey, you too. God bless. Sam.